I'm delighted to introduce Alberta Poss as our next featured member in our CEPIS featured member series. Please, Alberta, can you introduce yourself and just tell us what you're doing and who you are? Just talk about myself. Yeah. Okay, so I'm right now still, I mean, this COVID craziness, right? We are all doing things remotely. So I'm on a sabbatical right now, which is useful for me because I can't, I have to be the, pro, I'm the program chair for this year's online meeting. That's mm -hmm. going to be June of this year. And we were going to have it in person in uh, Switzerland because we thought it would be over by now. But then I haven't, I don't know about you people, but I haven't even had my very first vaccination. Have you had your vaccination yet? I had my vaccination, my first vaccination, but um, it's running very slow at the moment in Austria, yes. That depends. So I know in, like I had a meeting this morning with the conference committee. There was me, there was Greg Enriquez, there was Shigeru, there was Uli Kramer, who's going to be the local chair at our meeting next year. Who else was there? Um, I think there was someone else. Tracy, Tracy, who's our membership secretary. Yeah. We were all meeting today and he, Shigeru said that in Japan, they're not doing their, their vaccines either. Oh, really? So, I mean, I'm on lists, so I have, and I probably, when I called uh, John Norcross and asked him if he would be on our, do one of our plenaries this year, and he said no. He, the reason why he said no was he said that he felt that he was gonna be on a cruise this summer. And I thought, well, good for you. And he had apparently had already a couple of his vaccines. So oh, that was really? he's a front, apparently frontline worker. So I could get my vaccines. I've told people that I'm a frontline worker and I can get vaccines, but not at the moment. I'm not like, a, I don't see old people in old folks home or I'm not a nurse. So <laughs> apparently you get put in a waiting pool based on those criteria. I see, so the priority. My research, yeah, mm -hmm. it depends. It's all very layered, I guess, hierarchical, hierarchically layered. Yeah. So I do, I'm a process researcher by trade. So I'm the kind of person who is more interested, I'm less interested in the horse race, like who's the winner. Like I always think of, of research as being horse race research or process research. Horse race research is more like, you know, who's better than me, CBT or psychodynamic or experiential, like who wins the race? What's the horse that I should back and all that stuff. So I don't believe that part. I'm more interested in what works. So that's why emotion is the theme for our conference because I think it's a, a trans theoretical process. Everyone's working with emotion. And in fact, I actually have, a, I teach at York University, I'm in the clinical program there. And I teach the clinical students in that clinical program. And one of the things that I've done is I teach theory. So basically I teach all the theories. I teach behavioral theory, I teach CBT theory, I teach psychodynamic theory, I teach all of the theories. So basically it's kind of like important to be able to understand that all of, and I teach about emotion, like experiential therapy is the one that's has been closest to the emotional path, but mm -hmm. everyone's doing emotion. CBT people are doing emotion with their core beliefs Psychodynamic people do emotion with their transference stuff. I mean, they have particular foci of where they're going to look at a particular emotions, like in their history or their narrative of their history, but uh, they still do it. So I kind of show them, I show my students that basically it's a trans theoretical process. Everyone's working on this. It's just, they're working in different parts. And when you mm -hmm. consider emotion as a multi-component process, like Klaus Scherer in Switzerland has talked about in one of his articles, Klaus Scherer was in the University of Geneva, I think. Yeah. And he talks about emotion being a transpersonal or a trans theoretical process, and it's a multi-component process. So I agree with him. I think that there is, depending on how you look at it, if you focus on the needs, if you focus on the thoughts, if you focus on, the, on your history and what's made you sensitive to certain triggers, it depends, you know, what you're doing. Completely. And I've seen that you have worked with EFT a lot. And yes, I have. Do you think that EFT is a little bit more trans theoretical as well? Or would you say that's coming from a specific area or what, what you- Well, I mean, it has its home in an experiential point of view. So there's definitely that piece to it. It's definitely got client-centered relationship at the core. It's got mm -hmm. 
experiments like two chair work and that kind of stuff. The only difference I think between EFT and the reg its home base is that it's added a lot. And you can see that Les Greenberg is quite an integrative guy. He's been trained in a lot of different approaches. He was trained in systems approaches with, um, he trained with Mnuchin and he also trained with the, the woman, God, I should know her name. Virginia, no, not Virginia Satir, um, the other one, um, whatever. I'm sorry, I can't, I should remember her name. She's done, maybe it is Virginia Satir. Maybe it is. Yeah. Anyway, so basically it's very, it's very feeling wise, you know, mm -hmm. so it's, but it's also very cognitive in the sense that he's, Les has always been very interested in the brain. He collaborates with people like Richard Lane, who's gonna be at our conference this year. He's gonna do a plenary on neuro, on um, reconstruction and memory reconsolidation. He's less is interested in that. So it's a very broad, and but I do agree that I'm, I'm fundamentally, that is my home base. So insofar as it's my home base, but I've integrated, right? Yeah. I think it's really important to, even EFT has got pieces missing in it, I think. I think that's beautiful, as you said, if you're looking at from a process um, theoretical perspective, it's about what works and there can be still tweak and twist things to work better. And I think that's a very beautiful, it's not about who is the best and who wins, but it's more understanding what it is that is working and yeah, how people part. change. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really important, some people need more to change than others. Like I, years ago, I was in a panel I was a guest on a panel uh, that Ken Levy did in Washington, DC. He was the program chair there when we were doing in-person meetings. And one of the things he was talking about was the client and how the client drives that bus of psychotherapy integration. I think that different clients have different needs yeah. and depending on what the client needs, you're gonna have to be more integrated. The harder the client gets, like if you have a borderline client or you have a personality disorder client or you have some of the substance abuse issues, the more difficult the client becomes, the more integrative you have to be. And that's sort of what drives, I think, our integrative perspective often. That's very beautiful. And what do you think is, is the point where you'd say you understand what it is that the client needs? How do you, how do you identify those Well, I think things? what we, you discover, it, I mean, you come up against a, uh, some sort of, you're not making progress. So you feel like you're driving through mud or something isn't working. So you think to yourself, what is it that this person actually needs? So one of the things I've actually been doing a lot of work on recently is working with personality disorder clients mm -hmm. it's who are, have affect regulation difficulties. I call them card clients, clients with affect regulation difficulties. Yeah. And those are numerous clients. Some people have personality disorders. Some people have substance abuse disorder. Some people have eating disorders. It's, there's a number of issues that relate to that. But I think what's really, ha I've lost track now of what your question was. I forgot. Um, where you identify what- Oh, how do I identify? Yeah. So the issue is basically, I might like, for example, I've discovered, for example, that some clients really need a lot of orientation. In fact, I think that orientation is a very strong theoretical or trans theoretical factor. Mm -hmm. People, it's a missing need. If you look at Murray's need triangle, where he talks about your basic needs, your physiological needs and your self-esteem needs, your needs for love or whatever, and then the top of it is self-actualization. I think a fundamental need that we all have is to know what the hell is going on, yeah. which is orientation. Mm -hmm. and in fact, there was a guy at U of T who did um, neuropsych research and he stimulated the brain of different rats or mice or whatever. And he found that 70% of the time that he stimulated any brain, any part of the brain, didn't matter where it was, he got an orienting response. And so the, the animal was going, where the hell am I and what's going on out there? So I think that's really important. So one of the things I've done with EFT, for example, yeah. is to help, client, help therapists get better at orienting clients to the model. That's one thing that we're really bad at. And CBT is really good at that. Like mm -hmm. describe what we're doing and why we're doing it and that kind of thing. It's really an important piece. Some people do it naturally and other people don't do it naturally. So I'm trying to train people to do it more. I think that's a very beautiful way to understand one important need of the clients to have orientation because otherwise when you don't know where to go that might 
give a fear response. You don't know what, what's happening. Yeah, you don't know what's going on. Like, where, what am I doing? Why am I here? Do I like, I mean, the issue is, I think sometimes when a client needs orientation and you give it to them, they like you better as well. And they feel that you're more competent because you actually are able to understand that that need is there. The need to know what's going on and how we do things and why we do things is an important part. I completely agree. And it's a very beautiful perspective and that I think that directly relates with the emotions the client has. And based on that, if he has orientation, then he will be more secure, more security gives more relationship and more relationship gives the opportunity to be able to work more and more with emotions. Exactly. And you're less fearful. Yeah. It's less strange. I think everything's about emotion because orientation is about fear. It's about knowing where I am and feeling like I have more control over my environment because I know where I am. It's all part of that puzzle. Yes. Ah. What, would you, what else would you like me to talk about? I would like to ask you, so your current project and your practice and your work, just where you're working, you said you're working in York at the moment. Yeah. I teach at York, so I do research there and I teach. I'm very much interested in long-term resolution of things. And I think emotion has got a lot to do with that. I think if you go deep enough, you'll have a longer term uh, solution to your problems that you've got. So that's one thing that I do is I work on long-term resolution of in our particular area. We work a lot with depression. So that's one thing I've been doing. Another thing I've been doing is education. I do a lot of psychoeducation around emotion education because I think we have a model in EFT around primary, secondary. We, we're more, we're better at layering and making distinctions around the emotional world and the emotional field. And I think it's an important thing that people need to learn about that that's, what, that's how we work. That's what we pay attention to. That's what we're interested in. So I will, for example, pay attention. I use a term called hot teaching. So for example, I teach people when they emit markers for a particular kind of information. So when they actually are angry or they're afraid of their anger, for example, I say, you know, I think right now what's happening is that you're afraid of your anger. We would call that a secondary emotional reaction. You've got a primary emotion called anger, and then you've got a secondary emotion on top of that. It means I'm afraid of being angry. So that's going to make it complicated for you to have that secondary process. And what's gonna be helpful for me to do and help you as a therapist is to help you understand that process, to understand what's so scary about anger, and then also be able to understand that anger is important and when it's important and how it can help you. Good, very nice. And how do you work with that secondary emotion then? So it's and giving the understanding and helping by understanding to resolve. The secondary emotion is very, is much more mental than like when you have primary emotions, like primary emotions are more universal, they're more adaptive, they're more, you know, uh, they're more human in the sense that we all have certain situations where we feel certain things. Like mm -hmm. we were talking about when you are, are disoriented, you feel fear because you don't know where you are. You don't know if you're going to be able to handle what's coming your way, all that kind of stuff. So fear is makes sense in that situation. A secondary emotion will always be one that is a kind of either you don't like feeling what's underneath or you're not allowed to feel what's underneath. So we have to actually help you understand, like, what is it that's interfering? Is it because I can't stand it or is it because I'm not allowed to? So, for example, we had a girl in our in one of our emotion workshops who was from, uh, I think she was from Puerto Rico or something. She was from a Spanish island. And she said basically that I'm not allowed to be angry on my, in my family. I'm only allowed to be nice because mm -hmm. girls can be nice. Boys can be angry, but girls can't be. So there's that whole issue. The secondary emotion often will come from gender rules. They'll come from, from cultural rules, uh, uh, whatever, family rules, whatever it might be. So that's what I try to actually help someone understand what the rules are that they're working under. And as soon as the understanding is there, that helps to come from the secondary emotion to the primary emotion. It can. We can just begin to orient people. What you try to do is you try to get past the secondary and you try to go to underneath that secondary emotion to find out what's really happening down deep. Mm -hmm. 
then you, I mean, it's okay to be afraid. I, just, like, I tell people, I said, it's not my job to tell you what to do, but it is my job to tell you what's happening. Hmm. I think it's going on based on my model and to help you, to help you also understand the price that you may be paying by, by functioning in that way. And then we can have a conversation about how you'd like to change perhaps. Mm -hmm. And when do you think the long-term therapy is important because you said that's something you're really looking into and where is the difference between a short-term and a long-term therapy then? You know, it's really interesting that you're asking me that question because I think some people do need more therapy and some people, I mean, what we've been doing at York University is looking at short-term treatments and most people do. They want treatment to be over in 16 to 20 weeks or three weeks or eight weeks or whatever it is. They want it to be short and fast. No one wants to spend any time mm -hmm. doing anything. So what I'm doing, when I say, uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to predict what's happening in those short-term models that predicts long-term gains like 18 months after the therapy's over. So for example, for one thing, the relationship, when you measure outcome at the end of treatment, you are confounding potentially, you're, also, you're confounding the relationship and the satisfaction that comes from having had a relationship with someone with something that's actually happened in the therapy to help that person change. Mm -hmm. so I don't, I can't tell eight, uh, right at the termination point that therapy has actually been successful because you might actually just like me. Yeah. It really helps figure out is the long term, like 18 months after therapy is over, then people are more likely to be there. They've had relapses or they have, are they doing better or whatever it is. And it hasn't happened because of the relationship. The relationship's already been over for a year and a half. So that's why I do things like I, I pick outcomes that are more distal or farther away from the termination point mm -hmm. so that I can say that this is what's really going to help the person long-term become more resilient. Can you give me a sneak preview of what your outcomes are that you say? One of the things we've looked at is, um, well, obviously emotional processing. Mm -hmm. So we tried to figure out whether EFT is a, is a trans-theoretical kind of predictor. It's, if it has a, it's a good, good enough theory to work at the beginning or to start off, us off at, as being a good prediction of what's going to happen long-term. So independent of the therapy you receive. So if we do experiential therapies like client-centered therapy or EFT therapy, we just take all the good outcomes, regardless of what therapy you had, and yeah. we try to figure out if the good outcomes have a certain profile emotionally or the poor outcomes have a certain profile emotionally. And if that's going to predict whether they're going to be depressed at 18 months after therapy is over. So what I do is I pick, uh, we have had outcome measures at 18 months sometimes. We have the IIP, we have the Rosenberg self-esteem scale, we have the SCL90ER, and we also have the BDI, and maybe we might even have the Hamilton. So what I do is I choose a BDI score that's under 10 at 18 months. If you are under the 10 mark, people, I mean, that's what they say. They say that, you know, in the, in the literature, it says that if you have a BDI that's less than 10, then you're not depressed. Yeah. So I kind of wait for the 18 month outcome scores. And if they have a BDI under 10, they're not depressed. And if they have one 10 or above, they are depressed. So I kind of try to parse them that way. That's a very interesting way to look at outcomes and to see what is there after the relationship. And it's something because it also a little bit contradicts to the current research that people are yeah. doing. They're looking into relationship, relationship, and relationship, which I think is a very worthwhile thing to do. But I think, but you know what's really interesting is that how you measure relationship is also important because mm -hmm. if you use one relationship scale, like say you use the working alliance inventory to measure trans theoretical, or you think it's a trans theoretical measure of the relationship. It's not really a measure of the relationship. It's a measure of the goodness of fit between a person and the relationship style and that therapy model that they like. When you, you say that a relationship or alliance is built up of therapy goals, tasks, and um, there's tasks, there's goals, and there's, what else is there? Oh, the bond. Yeah if you like the person or not. So, but I still think, I mean, even, even uh, what's his name, who wrote the uh, Alliance paper, Borden, even mm -hmm. who actually wrote the Alliance, the first Alliance paper was the guy who said that it's really a fit variable. 
And I agree. I think if you're measuring the work, if you're using the working alliance inventory and you're getting agreement, all it's, all it's actually checking for is agreement. I like the goals. I like the tasks. It's not actually describing the tasks. It's not saying I like chair work or I like this or I like work, transfers work or I like lying on the couch or whatever it might be or I like working the thought record. It doesn't say any of that stuff. So you don't really know what you're measuring is what I'm saying. It depends sometimes. You have to be very, very careful to watch what you're actually measuring, I think. I agree. And that's why I think your approach is really beautiful to look at long-term outcomes and see what happens after the relationship, especially if you look at the common factors in psychotherapy. And if relationship is one, but then- It may yeah. be one. Yes, maybe one. And then- what And then you could have the working alliance inventory predicting you know, perhaps a BDI at 18 months. And for some clients, it may be the relationship that is the most important thing. Yeah. It may be that a particular client likes the fact that someone witnessed them and saw them and they feel very seen. And so that helps them a lot. Like I remember when I was doing my own therapy years ago, I remember watching, I remember a therapist who worked with me and she was kind of very independent and strong. And I remembered saying to myself at some point, I don't have to take care of this woman. Mm -hmm. I can just be myself and not worry about her. I don't have to take care of her. Yeah. So it was really important to me because I realized at the time that I wanted to have more people like her in my life and less people who I needed to take care of. Hmm. <laughs> I like so that. the relationship was really important for me. Yeah. Hmm. A lot of interesting thoughts going on in my mind and I'm yeah. very keen about reading and listening to your outcome measures and long-term outcomes. I'm, I'm, I just can't wait to, to... We'll see if we can get it published. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's always the, the, the question. But I There's the politics of, of that as well. I mean, I think that's the one thing that CEPI is really very, very aware of is the political nature of psychotherapy and science and the whole bit. Yeah. You, can't, you can't avoid it. There are, there's rule. Like, I mean, remember there was a guy, I watched a podcast recently. There was this Irish guy and he was talking about, what was his name again? I forget what his name is. He's from Ireland and he's a scientist. And he was basically saying, let me see if I can find it. Let me see if I can find it. I'm gonna go here. I'm gonna look up Irish scientist. Oh, he's, he was a young guy now. Young Irish, no, whatever, it doesn't matter. Videos. Maybe this is the guy. No, anyway, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. These, yeah, this guy was very aware that uh, science is somehow sometimes constructed and we have to follow rules and it doesn't matter what you do, some truths will not be debunked. People want to believe that the alliance is the most important thing. So they want to use this measure. So if you don't use it, you're not in the club and you don't get to be published, for example. Yeah. And so be aware of that. I think you're completely right that science is a political thing as well. And if you it are can be, the, it can be. And I think that gives me a very good opportunity to talk about Sefi a little bit more okay. and ask you what do you think Sefi is actually having done positive for your career? How does it, how has it influenced your career? When did you get to know Sefi and what career stage were you and how, how did that influence you and your I'm, okay, so I'm right now in a late stage of my career because mm -hmm. I'm going to be 70. I'm 66 now. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll be a, soon that I can retire, another six so, or so years. But basically, CEPI was always a big part of my life early on. I think CEPI actually influenced me in a lot of different ways because it's hammered home to me um, the, the idea that um, first of all, that there are trans theoretical processes. And I think it's also hammered home to me this respect that I have for other approaches. It's harbored in me a, this a willingness to be open mm -hmm. 
And so I've met a lot of different people from a lot of different approaches. I've met I, and I've made friends in different worlds that I wouldn't normally have access to. I think what's happened in science in our scientific community and our clinical communities is that we're often very siloed. We are like Freudians or we're Kleinians or we're whatever, and we're not allowed to go outside of our our box, so to speak. Yeah. I think what Seppi's done is made it a habitual to go out of that box, made it more acceptable. So, uh, like even the work that the alliance, like I've done, we had we have different presidents that are different, have different points of view. Mm -hmm. Like we, Catherine Eubanks Carter, who's done alliance a lot of alliance work with Jeremy Saffron and Chris Moran in New York. So she's working at at Yeshiva, I think now. Um, we've had Shigeru from. Iwaka Bay, who's done a accelerated experiential psychodynamic psychotherapy, which is emotional at the core. Yeah. We've had uh, Nuno, who's done more narrative and he works with some of the Irish folks. So it's very broad. And I like that broadness of the CEPI way of being. Mm -hmm. I like that you can talk to people around the world. Art Bohart, I know him really well. Uh, he comes from my camp, but like George Silbershots, who's done a lot of psychodynamic stuff. I don't know him that well, but he's also been very involved in us and I got to know him. We get to go for dinner. We're very open. Uh, Barry Farber in New York, who people also who work on different topics, like Barry Farber is interested in music and he's interested in lying in therapy and that people lie. Mm -hmm. So there's different funky things that people do in SEPI that makes me more open, I think. So I'm inter I'm, tr I'm willing to try new things. I'm willing to try new methods. I'm willing to borrow from other people's camps. All that stuff comes from the SEPI point of view, I think. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, if I understand it correctly, it influenced you on the personal side a lot because you got to know a lot of people which are really interesting to talk with and have conversations. It influenced you on the theoretical perspective because it helped you to understand different perspectives and see that there, that there are actually trans-theoretical um, parts in, in, in um, psychotherapy. And on the other yeah, hand, yeah. It also influenced your practice. So on all spheres of, of your personality. Yeah, yeah. it's how... really, really had a broad influence on me. That's, that's really interesting and really beautiful. And as you are the president, the current president of SEPI, what is your current goal? What is your One goal? of the goals? Yeah. So I think the big, a uh, big goal for SEPI, I mean, that's a big question. Like what are the goals? Mm -hmm. You know, you want more members for yeah. sure. We always want more members. So I'm going to keep going. I'm working on that part. But I think that we need to be really on track also with the electronic world, the electronic age, and continue to have a presence there. We've been doing online webinars and stuff. We can be broader that way. We can also have a great deal of access to people that we wouldn't normally have access to. I think one of the interesting pieces is that many people are integrated by nature, clinical people. And I think there's, there may be a little, I think the balance between research and practice is really important in CEPI. And I'm happy that we have that balance. Mm -hmm. But I think that there's also a part, we have to help clinicians feel more confident, I think, in what they're doing and what they have to offer and how they can direct good research. One of the complaints that uh, we've often heard about in the clinical world is that people don't want to pay attention to research because it's useless, they say. It doesn't help get any better. <clears throat> so it's interesting. I wrote a paper once on how to work with EFT and avoid personality. And I was in, <clears throat> I was in, <clears throat> excuse me, I was in Jerusalem and there was, and I saw Ben Shahar there at a conference and he, it was the SPR conference actually. And he came up to me and said, oh, you're the person who wrote that paper. And I said, yeah, what's up with that? Like it was, it's a big, so why is everyone, if you go to ResearchGate, it's been downloaded like 10,000 times or something. Okay. It's, a, it's really popular for some reason. I don't know why. And I said, like, what's up with that? Like, why are people downloading that paper so much? And why do people like it so much? And he said, well, I think it's because, he said, when I read that paper, he said, I read a lot of different research papers. And he says, but when I read your paper, I'm actually, I did something different in the very last, the very next session with the person I was working with, and I was better at it than I was before. Oh, so really? I, there you go. <laughs> Someone improve. 
So I think that's a big piece is to actually be able to actually talk in an intelligent way and to use distinctions that you discover are part of the of the toolkit of someone else perhaps but you have you get a you get more facility in being able to talk about it. i think that's really important and i think as clinicians we have to be more willing to stand up and say this is the kind of research that i want we have to be able to direct research more and be confident that we know what we're talking about and that we know we have something to contribute so i'd like to support that process if i can i wish you a lot of um, luck, <laughs> energy and a lot of luck that this is working out because I completely agree that especially from practitioners, I think there's a lot of things they know and, and um, understand that we need in research and also from research back to practice and this inter interaction between research and practice and sometimes it, it, it is really, really hard, as you said, that some practi practitioners say, why should I need research, but I think there's for both sides, there's a lot of things to learn. And um, I think researchers can be really snooty. They think <laughs> they know everything and they're so hot and they know it and they can, and in a way they get published and they get money and all that stuff. But the clinician who's in the trenches, who's really working with someone, they have, there's needs there as well that have to be articulated better perhaps. Hmm. It'd be interesting to find out very good ways on how to help practitioners and clinicians to formulate those needs better and, and see what would be possible. That's a very beautiful thing SEPI can do and try and find out. Yeah, I think it's a it's part of our mandate. Yes. Hmm. And that, I think, brings me to the next question is about what do you see as the future of psychotherapy integration? The future is like, well, I mean, the future psychotherapy integration is, I mean, I think it's there's, there's, there's no stopping us. It's like people are integrated by nature. In fact, it was really interesting. I was at a ABCT conference years ago and who was at that? I was, on a, I was at a panel that had Gerald Davidson on it who wrote the Bible, the, the behavioral Bible with Mark Goldfried. He and Goldfried wrote this Bible and they were on the panel together. And I thought that Marv would stand up for psychotherapy integration, but it was really interesting because what happened was Gerald Davidson said that they had won, as far as they were concerned, CBT had won, and that was the end of it. So then there was someone in the audience, a young man in the audience says, what if I don't give a shit, he said, about who wins? What if I care more about process and how to help someone? Uh -huh. What do I there? And he, Gerald didn't have an answer to that. But I thought to myself, well, there you go. That's the new generation of young folks who basically are talking about they don't care about the old school. They don't care about being a winner. They don't care about being a king. They don't care about all that stuff. What they want to do is be good at what they do and help people. So I think that's a really, that's where the trans theoretical. Mm -hmm. I think we really have to be very, 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 very aware how transpersonal therapy can be and that we're all basically digging in the same ground. We were talking a bit before we started our interview and I found out and heard that you were um, teaching in Vienna and you have been in Germany as well. Do you want to give us a yeah. bit intro? I was working in Germany because I was working with Helga Breuniger. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's why I was actually doing qualitative stuff. I was working with Helga Breuniger and K Catherine Myrtle. I was trying to get a, a, a qualitative um, I was doing some qualitative research around what female leaders are struggling with emotionally, what their repertoire of emotional problems might be. So mm -hmm. that was part of the reasons why I was working with that. So uh, Helga Breuniger was, she had been doing some work in Ulm. She had worked with, with uh, Kochala or whatever, or she had an affair with him or something, who knows what the hell goes on. Mm -hmm. And I remember years ago, we asked her for some money because she was, she was some rich German girl from Stuttgart and Berlin. And we said, like, you know, can you give us some money to do research? She says, no, nope, not going to do that. So that's when we came up with this, this idea of doing the qualitative by stuff. So I said, well, what if we are, she said, here's what I want. She came back as a clinician and she said, this is what I want. I want to basically teach female leaders 
how to be more emotionally sophisticated. Mm -hmm. That was her goal. Because her goal was that she felt, she was working a lot with um, women in Germany who had, uh, who had a lot of secondary emotions around their brothers or, and their fathers, basically. Mm -hmm. Maladaptive emotion around their father, primary adaptive anger at their father, a lot of secondary emotion around their brothers who got, the fathers tended to give the, the family business to the brothers, even though the girls might've been better at it, and may have been doing a good job at it or whatever, they got kind of tossed aside in favor of the boys. And then the boys would get it and then they wouldn't know what to do. And they would go to their sisters and try to ask for help. So the girls were saying like, why is that? And why do I have to do that? And I don't want to do that. And they would be angry at it. And so that's what I was working on. I was helping them become more, it was more clinical at the time at the beginning. And then the clinical stuff became more qualitative at the beginning, because we were trying to figure out what was going on in these women's lives and why is it they were struggling so much and what was it that they were working on? Mm -hmm. Most of the rule driven stuff that they were actually working with and that they're struggling with and the maladaptive emotions that they felt about their original parents. But there was this one girl from Germany. I used her as an example in the workshop. She had maladaptive anger I would call maladaptive because when she was like 13 or 14, her parents gave her the business and told her to run the business. Of course, they weren't actually giving it to her. They just gave it to her. In, but she didn't know that. She thought she had to run a business at the age of 13 or 14. So she was trying her best and doing this. And their parents were constantly, did you do this? Did you do that? Did you do this? Did you do that? They were constantly questioning everything she did. So she felt like, what the hell is going on? Like the, the real issue is, if you don't think I'm competent, then why did you give me the, the company? That's, and now when she's in a, she's now she's like 45 years old, she runs a business, she's very competent. But what happens is that she gets into a meeting sometimes and someone questions her, did, you know, where's this file or where's that file? And she immediately, it harkens back to the questions and the meaning of what questions were in her past the questions in the past were telling her that she wasn't competent. So she's in the present. When someone asks her a question, she says, don't question my competence. That's an overreaction to a trigger mm. from her past. Yeah. So I was trying to help them understand that process. Nice. And also you have been in Vienna at the Sigmund Freud University and worked. Yeah, you know yeah. So when I was in Vienna, what I was doing was I was getting supportive help from Catherine Myrtle, who does qualitative research. She does a lot of work with Atlas. So she knew a lot about qualitative stuff. And I also provided EFT workshops for the University of Vienna, the Freud University. And I provided two graduate workshops that I taught in the process while I was there. Beautiful. That's what I did when I was in, in Vienna. Um, do you want to tell us a, another fun fact about you? I mean, that was the, that's, that's like, what kind of tree are you? Are you a maple tree or an elm tree or what kind of animal are you? What kind of dog are you or whatever? So I was trying to think of like, what's a fun fact about me? Yeah. Well, one of the, one, I think one of the fun facts about me is that, um, is that I'll do anything. I have a kind of re recklessness about my character that is that helps me i think hmm. so i will try new things i'll do it so i had i had a picture i was going to send to you but i couldn't find it because i have a hard time accessing stuff being online and covid and all this kind of stuff it's on my computer at work it's a picture of me walking with a cheetah oh really yeah it's a and it looks like really dangerous but it's actually it was a half half tame cheetah and it was very nice little cheetah named Sylvester. You can look him up on the internet. Uh, and I have a picture of me walking and the cheetah walking behind me and no problem. So that's what I'm gonna send you send to you when I can find it. So if you want to see Alberta with the cheetah, you have to look at our Sefi Featured Member print version in order to see the picture. Um, yeah, exactly. So that's the, I think that's the fun, the fun piece. And anytime I try to, I'm willing to try new things. So I think that's, that's what makes me courageous. I've never been a card carrying anything really. 
In fact, I have arguments with Les, and I have arguments with everybody. I have arguments with Zindel Siegel, who does you know, CBT. I have arguments with Les, who does EFT. I do arguments with Paul Wachtel, who does dynamic, or with Ken Levy, who does dynamic. I'm, I'm the kind of person I see, I kind of have a puckish nature in that sense that I'll stir up the pot and try to create argument and stuff. But I think that's a very important core for integration as well, because if you don't question, you're just going to take what is that to you. And I think if you are critical and if you don't fear to be critical and have discussions with people, I think that's where you get integrative at its core. That's so interesting that you say that because I remember once going to a, where was it? It was my very first conference down, at, it was a Society for Psychotherapy Research. It was a, JPL, a JPR conference and it was in Snowbird, Utah years ago. And I went to the meet and greet. They have a, like a Wednesday night meet and greet where you can go and talk to people, whatever. And I was talking to Lester Laborski mm -hmm. and some other people there who were psychodynamic. And I remember looking across the room and there were all these people from York University wondering what the hell I was doing talking to Lester Laborski. And I thought to myself, why would I talk to you? I talk to you all the time. Of course, I've got to talk to someone else. Someone new, something different. But I still remember that their expressions were so quizzical and so like, what are you doing over there? Yes. I thought, well, I'm finding out something new. Very right. And that's why I can't wait to have our conferences in person again, because that's yeah, yeah. an opportunity to get to know people and interact and, and start real integration with real persons, because otherwise I think I'm really happy that we have the ability to do our conference now as an online conference, but it's something I think there's yeah. something different about a real person conference. And I have to say, I just learned this morning from Greg Enriquez, this new program that we're going to think we're thinking of using during our meeting, which allows you to have more of, of a of an integration of live and online stuff you get to, it's called what's it called again. It's called I think it's Wondershare something something about something to do with the room where you can go into a room and you can you have your picture and you can move your picture around and you can bump into somebody and then once you bump into someone or you get into their sphere you can have a, a conversation like in zoomish oh really and you don't have to worry about that extra focusing on cocktail party talk and all that stuff wow i i can't wait to see that I'm really looking forward we'll to We'll try to do that. Yeah, yeah. That's really great. Alberta, it was a great pleasure to have you in our featured member. And I'm very pleased for our discussion and can't wait to see you in person and definitely okay. at the conference. Thank you very much.